Hello, everyone. A very good afternoon to those who are joining us from Singapore and Asia, and a very warm welcome to all of you joining us from other parts of the world. Thank you for being here with us for today's event on home-based healthcare, the present and the future, presented by SG Innovate and Tejin Pharma. My name is Jin from SG Innovate, and we are Singapore's catalyst for opportunities in the global deep tech economy. Closely aligned with Singapore's research, innovation and enterprise plan, our work is centred on three key pillars, building and growing a robust deep tech talent pipeline, engaging deep tech communities to advance corporate startup collaboration and investing in, as well as supporting disruptive companies. To drive maximum impact, our efforts are prioritised around frontier technologies in the strategic areas of sustainability, healthcare and biomedical sciences, agri-food and advanced manufacturing. At SG Innovate, much of our work is to connect the deep tech ecosystem to explore the impact of science and technology in defining our future economy. In today's session, our panel of experts will be sharing the opportunities to enhance patient outcomes in the home-based healthcare setting by applying technology. During the session, we encourage you to engage with our speakers and presenters by submitting your questions in the Q&A box located on the lower panel of your screen. Without further ado, I would like to invite our moderator for this discussion, Tian Hui, to start us off. Tian Hui, please. Uh, thanks a lot, Jin, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as Jin has mentioned, my name is Tian Hui. I'm the Head of Investments for SG Innovate. Uh, today's panel is focused on one of the growing areas of interest within the healthcare industry. Now, home-based healthcare has traditionally been associated with end-of-life management. However, a few global trends have led various stakeholders like the government, uh, insurers, hospitals, and even patients themselves uh, to sort of review these long health perceptions. Now, these trends include declining healthcare outcomes, even while spending on healthcare had really has never been higher, a shortage of beds in hospitals leading to long waiting times, and of course, more recently, COVID, which demonstrated how quickly our healthcare services could be overwhelmed in a short space of time uh, by a global pandemic, forcing really non-critical treatments to be postponed. Uh, these trends show that the current mode of operation is not one that will work well to maintain the overall health of a population, as late treatment often leads to poor outcomes, yet costs the healthcare system considerably more. At the same time, improved technology in the areas of sensors, uh, AI for instance, are making early stage diagnostics and treatments more readily available outside the, uh, the hospital. Most governments are taking active steps to address such issues, Singapore, with its hugely ambitious goal of managing healthcare for all its citizens age 60 and above, would really not be able to do so effectively without considering home-based healthcare and technology. Uh, so this sector really represents a huge opportunity for the whole healthcare ecosystem to move towards a new modality uh, that will basically ensure better health outcomes for all. Today, I'm privileged to moderate this panel with three distinguished speakers representing three key pillars of the ecosystem. Uh, there's Aki from Tejin, Elizabeth from IHH, and Lillian from Tetsuya Healthcare. To kick off this session, I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves, uh, starting with uh, Aki. Perhaps you can get us started. Yeah, uh, thank you for starting the conversation. So I'm really, really happy to join the conversation today. Um, my name is Aki Maeda, uh, Senior Manager of uh, Business Development for Home Healthcare Business in Tejin Pharma Limited. Yeah, actually, I spent over 20 years in Tejin, and uh, almost half of my career in Tejin is for the business development. So during my career in Tejin, I also spent over five years in the United States to look for uh, potential uh, partners as a startup developing home-based healthcare business, especially for medical device. Uh, regarding our company, Tejin, uh, Tejin is a very unique company uh, in Japan. So originally, our company, Tejin, started as a chemical and the material business, uh, like the textile, resin, uh, film, industrial fiber, composite, and carbon fiber. But now, more focusing on the healthcare business. Uh, we are uh, a very interesting company, even in Japanese healthcare company. Uh, we have both prescri prescription drug and the medical device for home care, we emphasize the business synergies from both uh, drugs and uh, device business. I, again, I'm happy to join the panel. Thank you very much, Aki. Uh, maybe Lillian, you, you can introduce yourselves and your company as well. Sure, right. Hey, thanks, Yanhui. 
so my name is Lelia. I'm the uh, Managing Director and Co-Founder of Tetsuyu Healthcare. Not Tetsuya, but Tetsuyu Healthcare. Mm -hmm. So I know the, the name sounds a little bit Japanese, but I'm not Japanese. I'm actually a Singaporean homegrown. Uh, but I started this company in 2015 with a Japanese doctor, Dr. Shinsuke Muto, uh, who is a cardiologist and also a home care specialist. So his passion has always been to bring uh, the best of technology to enable home care uh, in a much bigger way. So uh, in 2015, when we first started, uh, our mission really is very clear that we want to create better access to quality care for people who actually want to age with dignity at home or within the community. So it's, uh, as a startup then, we were a little bit greedy. So we did both the technology enablement and also home care as a service. Uh, but we quickly realized that we needed to focus, right? Because as a startup, our resources are limited. So uh, we then basically gave up our home care service, but focused uh, squarely, right, on technology to enable care providers to do better in their community care uh, deployments. So in that sense, you know, we lift to tell the story. So I'm really, really happy today to be able uh, to join the session, to learn and also to share my insights. Thank you. Thanks, Lillian. And last, obviously, but not least, uh, Elizabeth. Great. Thanks, Tianhui. Um, I'm excited to be part of this panel and, and look forward to a, a very active discussion. Uh, so I am the group head of innovation at IHH Healthcare. Uh, many of you who are in Singapore may know uh, IHH. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, my screen is freezing. Uh, but many of you in Singapore know IHH from our four hospitals here, most notably Mount E, Novena, Mount E, Elizabeth, as well as Glen Eagles. But IHH is actually um, across 10 different markets today, and our primary focus is, is still on the hospital side. So we provide you know, secondary and tertiary and quaternary care in um, our facilities. But in addition to that, we are also actively looking at how we can expand and provide patients, our existing patient services, both upstream and downstream. Uh, Oops, I think... Uh... Liz, you're frozen. Can you hear us? Up on the okay. train and other. Hello? Yeah, yeah, we, we can hear you. We lost you for a short while, but that's okay. all right. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, so uh, let me know if you lose me again. But uh, so, so IHH is we're actually actively looking into how we can expand into home care services across all of our markets. Uh, key markets for us certainly include Singapore, Malaysia, India, as well as Turkey. Uh, in my role as group head of innovation, I'm actively focused on two different areas. One is the investment side. So looking at early stage venture investments in digital health or healthcare. Oops, and I lost it. capability. Yeah, okay. sorry, I, we, we lost you for a bit, but it's all right. I think, uh, okay. I think we got the gist of uh, what you're, you're saying. Um, so I, I suppose I'll start with you first. Um, and this question actually will be uh, asked of the three panelists, but maybe we can start with uh, Elizabeth. Uh, so, you know, how has home-based healthcare evolved over the years, you know, based on your experience? Uh, and in within which areas is it making the most difference? Yeah, great. Okay, uh, sure. Happy to take that uh, on. And can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, so I think uh, I would take this question in, in two parts. One is uh, coming from the U.S. How how I've seen that evolution and and what I think are the relevant pieces that could apply to Asia. So uh, as a you know investor from the U.S. who has actively invested in home health companies, uh, the traditional focus there has always been around more chronic conditions or assisted daily living. Oops, it looks like uh, we lost her. Uh, I tell you what, Jin, why, why don't you see if you can can find her, and maybe I will just I'll jump to Lillian. Uh, uh, maybe Lillian, you can you can reply to that question as well. Sure, sure. No, no worries. Let me just kind of um, give my some some insights first while we are waiting for a list. So I I would um, look at the evolution on three parts, uh, largely also drawing from my experience. Uh, you know, since entering the sector in twenty fifteen, 
uh, I would say that, you know, uh, over the last few years, we have actually moved from a very transactional, very fragmented way of managing healthcare uh, to where we are today, which is a lot more multidisciplinary, uh, a bit more, uh, I would say, more care planned managed. So in the past, I would, uh, you know, termed it to be very transactional in the sense that a lot of people who were asking for home care or prepared to actually, you know, uh, have home care, uh, those who require perhaps, you know, um, one-time type of transactions such as activities of daily living, uh, maybe an NGT change or wound care. Uh, and that could actually have been, you know, because of how funding and also how cost, you know, has kind of uh, been a bit of a impediment in the past. So when I remember the time that we started home care, many of the, um, you know, care providers we're really just playing, I would say, a transactional game whereby it's then as many nurses or care staff providers to actually go into homes uh, to do, you know, small things. Uh, and you would say that, you know, there isn't really much of a care planning involved. Uh, and many of these so-called um, uh, issues such as, you know, chronic disease management was managed, I would say, by specialists and also within the um, acute, you know, uh, specialist outpatient clinic setting or doctors. Uh, I see the shift currently, you know, where uh, there is a lot more of uh, care planning involved, largely because I would say that in the last five, six years, especially in Singapore, there's been a lot of emphasis, uh, you know, in terms of home-based healthcare, right, by our government. Uh, a lot of the means-tested uh, so-called subsidies is now available, right, to people who actually need home care in a holistic manner. And with the licensing, you're actually seeing a lot more of that care planning, care management, and ecosystem build. Right? So from a fragmentation, you're seeing um, a much stronger ecosystem coming into play. And of course, you've also seen um, a lot of new business models, right, uh, that's powered by technology that allows uh, this ecosystem to become a lot more uh, tenable, right? So you see uh, companies like Homage, you know, where a lot of these supply management actually has uh, made it possible for them to recruit, you know, big numbers of uh, care providers into the ecosystem to be able to help, you know, manage some of this care. Uh, and you also obviously see technology come into play. And I think, you know, more recently you would see telemedicine, right, taking on a very big role, right, in terms of replacing the home visits, right, allowing consultations to be done remotely, monitoring to be done remotely, escalations to be done, you know, very instantaneously. So all these, I, th I think, you know, has um, created the impetus for a shift, right, towards uh, a more ecosystem built, a lot, uh, a, a more, I would say, um, uh, structured, you know, way of managing home care. And of course, you know, like I said, technologies, including hospitals at home technology, has allowed for a lot more types of um, patients to be managed in a home environment versus in the past, whereby it's so much more, I would say, uh, transactional and simple types of care. So I would say that this is, you know, holistically how the evolution has happened in the last few years. Okay. Uh, thanks, Lillian. Uh, we have Elizabeth back. Um, perhaps, Elizabeth, you may want to uh, finish uh, your, uh, your, your reply to that particular uh, question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to not turn on video for now, just to uh, try to preserve my internet connection here. Uh, so what, what was the last thing you all heard me speak about on this question? Uh, I think you had barely started speaking when it sort of froze. So, so I think uh, it'd be worthwhile to just... Uh, do you want me to repeat the question? Uh, no, no, I'm good. So, so I'll, I'll just say that, uh, so uh, the way we look at it is, is certainly from two perspectives. One is looking outside Asia and some of the more established markets like the US, you know, where uh, I was previously investor in and uh, actively involved in, in home health uh, and had a few home health portfolio companies and how I see that translating into Asia. So in the U.S., you know, where a lot of these companies and, and the market has been quite mature and is more on the you know, ADL, assisted daily living activity support, as well as uh, less clinical activities. And when we think about home care, it, it includes not only that, but also ideally would encompass some of the more clinical related services and, and uh, uh, products you can offer patients in the home setting. 
Uh, and so what we have been seeing is quite, you know, interestingly and, and uh, an exciting way is that there are companies in the U.S. who are starting to focus on the more clinical aspects of care in the home. There are companies such as Medically Home who are trying to enable not only remote monitoring of uh, patients who have been recently discharged, but even care coordination of these patients at home, right? And being able to ensure there's connectivity between the nurses and the doctors and the various specialists that may oversee a patient's care and making sure there's the proper hardware and software that uh, enables that care. So that's quite exciting. And then we see that continue to be a positive trend in the U.S. Now, how, how does that translate into Asia and um, I mean, Singapore in particular, right? The, the, the way we see it is that it's certainly earlier days in, in Asia uh, and this part of the world. Um, but given the, the growing demographic trends and, and the aging population, we are encouraged by you know, the recent uh, initiatives we've seen both on the public restructured hospital side as well as with you know, the government and recognizing and, and providing coverage for uh, clinical home care uh, and being able to allow patients to use inpatient, you know, uh, coverage to essentially have that care be done at home. So we see that as a move in the right direction, uh, but I think it's still unclear in, in this part of the world how the model is going to evolve, how, how can we incentivize and, and motivate different players in that ecosystem that all the different players are needed to provide the patient appropriate care. Uh, to make sure that this is a viable model going forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, and Aki, finally, uh, to, to yourself, uh, how, how do you view the, you know, the evolution over the years and what areas do you see the most uh, potential for home-based yeah. health? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the actually Teijin is a Japanese company, so I would like to say, I'd like to speak about the ja uh, situation in Japan for home care. So the, actually the number of uh, patients taking care of the home care in Japan is very increasing. Um, so for this session, I actually tried to find the data from Japanese government for home care. So in fact, uh, according to the data from the Japanese government, uh, the number of claiming reimbursement, you know, the Japan is utilizing national healthcare system. So we, uh, the, all of the data for the reimbursement is very viable. So, uh, the number of claiming reimbursement for home care is roughly uh, over three times down 15 years uh, ago, 15 years before. So, uh, and also all the claim uh, clinics and the hospital supporting the home care are also increasing. So typically the home care uh, can be provided by the kind of the uh, traditional DME provider also a small clinic uh, involving with the local areas. Uh, but the, uh, right now, uh, many of the hospital, uh, big hospital and the uh, kind of the traditional clinic are also involved to the home care. So many of them, many of patients are, you know, the uh, elderly people like over 75 years old. So uh, it's very important for the stakeholders about how to, in how to involve the patient, how to, uh, you know, the engage the patient with the home care. So uh, that's a very important point in Japanese uh, some circumstance. And also uh, Japanese government uh, mentioned uh, to facilitate make, making a comprehensive uh, integrated care model. Uh, that means, again, the involving very, uh, many uh, care systems such as uh, uh, pre prevention of care pre and the traditional medical intervention, nursing care, and uh, life support and housing. So involving uh, various, you know, the systems uh, are very important right now for the uh, home care in Japan. So uh, technology is adding uh, the value to the kind of the uh, integrated care model are required. And then the many of the startups uh, are very actively uh, developing uh, such technologies to the home care uh, in Japan. Okay, thanks, you. Thanks, Aki. Uh, and to just follow on from the from what you've just uh, shared with us, what 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 are the uh, what do you think is driving this evolution? What do you think? Why do you think the home care business in Japan has grown? I mean, obviously there are demographic reasons, there's technology reasons. 
Um, what, 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 in your opinion, is, is driving this? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So I think uh, there are some reasons why uh, the home care in Japan is growing. So I think one of the reasons, uh, as I said, uh, because of kind of the governmental policy in Japan. So, you know, the, uh, since Japan is facing the uh, elderly uh, kind of, the, uh, you know, the generation for the future, uh, Japanese, so that the Japan is facing lack of care uh, labors uh, to elderly. And uh, at this time also uh, home care uh, has no uh, strong and, uh, you know, the big margin uh, of the business. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, compared with uh, traditional, you know, the uh, hostile uh, care. So uh, it, it's very important point for the, uh, you know, the companies uh, about how to manage the home care business. So, uh, but the, uh, recently we can see some of the new reimbursement code in the national healthcare system for home care uh, registered to improve quality uh, of care uh, in the, host, uh, in the uh, home setting in Japan. Also, I think uh, the another reason uh, is progress uh, of the uh, digital technology, as uh, Mr. Ton said at the uh, beginning. So, new technologies like AI and the vital sensing uh, enable patient care uh, at home very successful, uh, even in Japan. For example, as uh, Lilian mentioned, uh, remote patient monitoring is also a key factor in Japan to correctly understand the patient condition at home, as well as predicting, for example, uh, the exacerbation of the clinic, chronic disease. So the uh, patient taking care of uh, the home-based uh, care is for the chronic condition. So uh, correctly understanding the patient patient condition for, or especially for the chronic patient are very uh, important in Japan. Yeah, thanks, Saki. Uh, and Liz, I think uh, you alluded to some of the, uh, you know, drivers for this, uh, this trend uh, in Singapore and, and, and this part of the world. Um, but in your opinion, uh, you know, what is, what was really driving this in the US? Because I think you saw quite a lot of this you saw a lot of maturity in that particular market, and you're only just starting to see nascent shoots in this part of the world. Are the are the drivers the same, or are they uh, quite different? Yeah, I, I think um, you know, that's an interesting question. I think uh, Tianhui, that there are certainly some parallels right between the U.S. market and and uh, in in the markets we see in Asia. So, for instance, there in the, even the U.S. You know, a few years back, you remember there was a, a trend where there was a lot of B two C home care businesses, uh, essentially uh, platforms that are taking caregivers and matching them with uh, you know, patients or uh, those who have family members that may need care. Uh, and this was kind of right around the time when Uber and then a lot of these kind of B two C e commerce platforms took off, right? And and since then, you know, some of them have have been able to pivot or survive, but a lot of them actually have, have not done so well. Uh, and, and so that's kind of one aspect of, of the business, which we've seen some companies in, in this part of the world also trying to replicate. But you know, what we see is really the, the more sustainable and, and valuable areas will really be uh, a combination of, of companies that focus on services and technology that really enable true coordination of care between the healthcare setting, whether it's the hospital or the clinic or the rehab facility with the, the home care setting, whether it's directly with the patient or the, the family member who's taking care of the patient. Right? And, and not, in that respect, I think what has driven the US and hopefully we'll see that also take off in Asia is, is really, I would say on the payment side, right? In terms of both the government as well as private payers, recognizing that there could be improvement in outcomes, you know, lower cost of care, fewer complications, if patients can be uh, taken care of in the home as opposed to spending a few extra days in, in a hospital. And, and that may sound a bit controversial to say from coming from a private healthcare operator like mm -hmm. IHH, but uh, you know, we, we also recognize you know, we, one of our main models is really providing and putting patients at first, right? Uh, and, and what that means is providing the appropriate care for the patients in whichever setting that is most beneficial to them. So from a length of stay, if we look at, or how many uh, days you should be in a hospital after a procedure, 
really trying to figure out what is the optimal number to maximize their, their clinical outcome and ensuring that they're able to you know, return home and not have to come back to the hospital uh, you know, a few days later for complications, right? So as long as that, that kind of journey and then that pathway is set, you know, we're certainly very interested in looking how we can partner and invest in companies that can provide that guidance and navigation for patients once they leave our hospitals. Uh, and, but the, the part that's still unclear, I think this part is really around the, the reimbursement and the payment model. Who's gonna cover it? Uh, is it going to be out of pocket for patients, uh, which you know, a lot of patients are not willing to, to pay for? Uh, is it gonna be subsidized? So these are the things that I think we, we still haven't figured out yet in, in Asia, where I think in the US, a lot of that, those questions have been answered. Mm. Okay, that's a good point, Elizabeth. Um, maybe Lillian, uh, I think uh, you have actually articulated quite a lot of uh, you know uh, drivers for home-based healthcare. You know, in, in your earlier reply to my uh, to my question, uh, are there any more that you see within the local markets or in the Japanese markets where you operate? I think um, one key driver, obviously, is that people. I mean, and all of us included, actually want to um, age at home. So I think this is a desire that you know most people would have, but but for right, but for the the fact that it's probably not affordable unless there is good funding. So I think in Singapore, you know, with the changes in Medisave, uh, and also you know the mindsets that insurance companies are starting to have, uh, it's starting to shape the, the the ability for us to actually have hopefully more affordable uh, home health care. So I think that's that's a, a important impetus. That's going to drive uh, home-based healthcare uh, in a very big way, uh, and of course, I think technology together with the right kinds of business model, and I think that's what Liz also, uh, you know, mentioned. Um, there are many technologies out there, different types of business models out there uh, that, in a way, have um, failed. I would say, you know, uh, over the last uh, few uh, years, those that have actually succeeded. Uh, still needed to ensure that they are tapping on uh, some form of a wave because of the funding uh, that, that's available. Uh, and also, you know, the uh, type of uh, workflows and, 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 and ecosystem that they're able to actually garner. So I would say that, you know, um, in, order, in order for this to actually move forward, uh, there needs to be obviously, you know, more uh, robust funding you know, push that allows uh, more people to actually want to take that dive into providing home care as a service and to be able to make money out of it. Uh, at the same time, also to actually ensure that, you know, the business models, the technologies that come alongside that becomes more affordable in the longer term. Okay. And Lisa, maybe I'll just stay with you because, uh, you know, you're a startup whose core business is home health care. Um, and you have alluded again to some of the possible macro reasons uh, or barriers uh, you know, uh, to adoption of this uh, particular modality of treatment. Um, but what are the others that you're seeing on the ground? I mean, you see these problems every day. Are there certain things which are hindering people from, you know, other than the obvious ones, you know, reimbursement and all that? Do you see anything else? Uh, risk, you know, uh, reservation on the part of family? So I, I, go on. I think skill gaps. Skill gaps is probably the, mm -hmm. the biggest um, problem that I would imagine, uh, you know, in a way, uh, you know, uh, brings that 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 that, that uh, impediment or the choke point. Uh, so you see that there are a lot of uh, I was there's obviously a staff crunch. You know, resource is limited, uh, but skilled nurses, you know, on the ground, it's always going to be difficult to get. Uh, already, we are finding so much trouble basically trying to get skilled nurses for uh, acute care settings. So let alone in a community, I don't think it's going to be very easy for us uh, to see, you know, the numbers of uh, home care nurses uh, that at a level of skill whereby a uh, very complex kind of care can take place, right, in a home setting. Unless, of course, there's technology that can actually help to um, assist, you know, in some of this clinical decision support. So I think skills gap, skills gaps uh, is, is, is one very big issue that we, we, we see happening. The second one, of course, uh, would be you know, the, um, the funding, right? Like I think we talked about earlier on, uh, how actually, you know, is funding being channeled, right? To ensure that, you know, the, not, not just the very vulnerable, right? But actually uh, the people who are middle class and above can also get access to good home health care, right? So I think these are the, the, the two main 
issues that uh, I do actually foresee uh, is going to put you know, a lot of that pressure in terms of the development of this. And of course, thirdly, in the past, um, technology was uh, obviously not mature enough. So, uh, you know, a lot of these um, home health care providers uh, do actually a lot of things very manually, right? So productivity has always been uh, a very big uh, problem, right? Because the cost of delivery is so high, right? But your, 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 your returns may be so little. And I think like what Aki mentioned, uh, you know, the margins are very, very thin, right, for, for home care. So if we do not actually have uh, a way to actually reduce the cost of delivery, you're going to actually see that uh, very few people want to participate, you know, in this kind of uh, services other than, you know, like in Singapore, a lot of charitable organizations. So private providers will be very, very few unless we can break that chain. Uh, so technology, to some extent, I think, can actually help us to overcome some of these delivery issues. So I think with some of these, uh, um, you know, optimization, productivity tools, so this AI enablement, the sensor enablement, uh, and equipping, you know, the, the uh, lower level nurses or care providers or care staff to be able to do more complex work, right, by ensuring that, you know, the workflows is embedded within the system itself. I think these will be uh, good ways in which we can allow the cost of provision to actually come down a little bit. Uh, and that kind of like widens the, the margin. So I, I, I feel that, you know, it's a combination of all these factors uh, that's going to help us, um, you know, form that basis or, you know, create that, that, that environment whereby home care can actually take off, right, in a more uh, robust manner. Okay. Thanks, Lillian. Uh, maybe, Aki, uh, you could share with us what you think uh, are the barriers, uh, you know, to adoption for this technology from, from Tejin's perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, as I said, uh, again, as Japan is using the national healthcare system, so that the, uh, the actually there is a, a kind of the upper limit of the reimbursement budget because the, uh, the healthcare cost in Japan is basically, you know, the coming from the kind of the taxation. So, uh, so that the Japanese government want to, you know, to save the cost of care, uh, even, in the, even in the home healthcare. Also, uh, they uh, they actually want don't want to create the, you know the uh, the new investment code with a higher margin, so that the uh, it has no actually strong motivation for many healthcare companies uh, to facilitate the uh, the home based healthcare because as as I said um, the investment system is not well considered to the home based care at this time. Um, uh, based on our experiences in Tejin, uh, acquiring a new reimbursement code for home care is very tough work. It's very difficult uh, for the company. We so that we, uh, how can I say, expect uh, deregulation to the home health care, especially for the investment uh, near future. So uh, it's kind of the barrier at this time in Japan for home care. Also. I think on the other side, uh, healthcare companies in Japan uh, have to consider kind of the out-of-pocket uh, service for, uh, you know, the home care uh, with, you know, the big effort to create a business. But the uh, regulation um, uh, in Japan uh, states out-of-care, uh, out-of-pocket care must be uh, clearly uh, distinguished from the insurance coverage care uh, due to kind of the, uh, it's again, it's kind of the uh, regulation. So it's very complicated system. So mm. I can say the detail <laughs> for this session because it's very complicated, but the, uh, I think uh, such com complex system uh, in Japan for care uh, brings more barrier uh, to Japanese healthcare companies as well as the uh, foreign companies, I think. Thanks, thanks, Aki. Um, Liz, uh, any thoughts on, on this, this matter? Yeah, so I, I would agree with everything that, you know, Lilian has brought up, uh, but I would say, you know, as a technology investor, what, where I see is, is the biggest barrier and potentially the, the biggest catalyst for, for changing the way things are is really technology. And, and the, the way I see where, 
it could address gaps today are a few areas. One is on the uh, reimbursement and payer side. I think there, it's, it's almost a chicken or egg issue in that payers are waiting to see improvement in, in outcomes and uh, fewer complications, faster recovery times in order to want to come up with viable models to cover it. At the same time, you need the coverage in order to even be able to prove out some of these data points, right? So I see one application of technology being able to link the hospital procedures and whatnot to the kind of home outcomes and home uh, improvements and being able to demonstrate that as a way to hopefully incentivize payers and, and government to as, as well to reimburse and provide coverage for home care. A, a second area is, is really what we may also talk about, which is you know, the, the shortage of skilled nursing. Right? It's, it's a problem that is prevalent, not only I think in Singapore, but across the region and uh, globally as well. And, and we certainly feel it at IHH you know, as, a, as a tertiary hospital operator. But a lot of the work that is being done is actually still quite manual. So the ability for technology to be able to digitize a lot of the work that you know, nurses even in hospitals are currently doing, which really takes away from the clinical work and is more administrative or focused on other aspects. If that can be digitized and automated, that would be another area where I think technology can improve and ensure that the, the skilled nurses you really do need or the skilled uh, task force you really need are focused on the appropriate tasks, right? And then the third area I would say is about that care coordination, which is I, something I also mentioned earlier, is ensuring that the information can flow seamlessly back and forth between the patient's primary care doctor or specialist, as well as whoever is involved in caring for that patient from a clinical perspective with the remote monitoring devices or uh, whatever machines or, or kind of caregivers are, are using at home and making sure that from a patient perspective, there are no gaps or laps in, in that care management. And if there are any issues that arise at home, the appropriate uh, clinicians are alerted to that and, and can come up with the appropriate care plan or interventions if needed. So I think that that's why you know, I, I come back to technology because I think if technology can come up with solutions to address those three issues, then we would see certainly a lot more progress in home health and, and the also evolution of, of that model. Okay, uh, thanks Liz. Uh, and I'll come back to you on some of those uh, issues because I mean, technology is one layer, but the regulatory pathway to actually start the, the mass adoption is actually quite a, a painful one as, as I'm sure you know, and, and I'm sure Lillian knows as well. Um, Okay, so maybe uh, Lillian, I'll, I'll come back to you again on, you know, Liz has spoken a bit about some of the technologies mm. that she thinks uh, could be very helpful um, to facilitate the adoption of home-based healthcare uh, amongst the masses. Um, are there any things that you can elaborate on uh, with regards to technology uh, areas that you think will assist and support this transition? Yeah, definitely. And I think I, I fully agree with what Liz has mentioned. Uh, in fact, you know, I suppose in the last... Five, 10 years, you actually start seeing that there's a lot of uh, proliferation, if you may, of different types of technologies that are addressing specific pain points uh, in terms of, you know, how health, home health care is actually being delivered. So I'll kind of group them, you know, a few buckets. Uh, one bucket, obviously, is in the area of productivity. So up to maybe about, you know, 10, 15 years ago, everything was actually largely pen and paper for home health care. Uh, but, you know, obviously, you know, with a lot of government funding, uh, in, in, at least in Singapore and in Japan, uh, there is a, it's a little bit more of that digitization that's happening. And of course, more recently, digitalization. So you see a lot of, you know, mobile apps, a lot of software uh, that's actually being created, targeted to make sure that the documentation components goes down, uh, you know, the, the, the level of productivity goes up. Uh, the second types or second bucket of, of technology Right, would be uh, from a skill gaps and compliance perspective. And exactly like what Liz mentioned in terms of ensuring that workflows and care plans are being followed, right? So um, a lot of these software that we talked about uh, has embedded workflows, which allows the uh, user to basically just follow step by step. So it kind of like, you know, overcomes a little bit of this skill training, right, that's required. Uh, so because of this resource constraint, you are sending lower level people. So obviously a checklist would be very easy for them to manage versus 
trying to remember every step that's supposed to be happening. So you see all these mobile apps with very you know easy to use tools whereby they can just do checklist style working. Uh, and of course, you know there's a lot of this clinical decision support. Uh, you know through rule based knowledge database whereby uh, you know simple I mean answers can be actually gotten for practically every question that can happen in a home healthcare kind of environment. Uh, and of course, you know um, AI, you know uh, image processing, for example. Uh, has made a lot of this kind of assessments very easy, right? For uh, maybe even lower level nurses uh, with a, you know, handphone, you just take a photo and then image processing allows the person to actually sense and get an assessment done. Information gets sent and if there's any escalation required, uh, you know, that, that immediately, right, generates some form of a response, which I think that's, that's also helping to actually bridge that skill gap. Uh, the third one, of course, it's, you know, the advent of mobile and networking technology, right? So, I mean, obviously, the handphone has been one of the largest driver, right, for home health care because every nurse will have a handphone, right? And with, um, you know, our 3G, 4G, 5, now 5G, now available, you know, the kind of speed in which some of this kind of work can be done is actually drastically reduced. So, I think that that, that really does help. Uh, in terms of how you know, home care has actually been pushed forward. And of course, you know, phone camera itself also has wonderful technology, a lot of sensing devices that's actually embedded, augmented reality, you know, your, 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 your LIDAR sensor and all that. So for us, even the cares for wounds, right, is actually um, uh, relying a lot on the AR and the LIDAR to actually get the measurements of the wound within one second. So that's how it actually, you know, um, helps actually the nurses do such it's good work in a very, very short period of time. And of course, more recently would be all the telephony, teleconferencing uh, related kind of technologies that's really pushed forth, right? In this COVID period, telecare, telemedicine. Uh, and I think all the connected um, uh, devices such as your, you know, uh, monitoring devices for blood group, uh, sugar, uh, blood pressure, blood glucose, even steps like wearables and stuff like that has certainly helped. Uh, and lastly, I think cloud technology, I think, you know, has also been a very big, uh, I would say, boost, right, for um, the home care players because you do not, you no longer need everything to be on premise, right, and you are able to do a lot of data sharing, you know, and you are also able to uh, operate a little bit more inexpensively because you're leveraging a shared multi-tenant kind of a cloud service. So I think, you know, in a nutshell, these are the few areas that I think, you know, technology has played a very, very big role in moving forward, right. The, the, the home healthcare movement. Okay, thanks Lillian. Um, Aki, uh, what about yourself? Uh, what, what kind of technologies do you think would facilitate this um, adoption and what do you think, uh, whether it's available today or tomorrow? Yeah, uh, yeah. so before uh, talking about technology, I think I have to speak about the comment from Japanese patient uh, taking the home care. So uh, based on the report and as well as our experiences in Teijing, uh, patients taking home care uh, are very worried about uh, acute and the sudden admission to hospital. Uh, if you know the health condition getting worse, is getting worse at home. Also, uh, the patient are very worried about the, you know the kind of the burden uh, to their family, patient family, even for pa patient family. Uh, who brings care of everyday everyday life? Uh, many, you know, uh, the home care patient like the elderly people uh, want to spend time uh, at home in end of the life. So this this is a kind of the, a general comment for the uh, elderly patient uh, taking home care. So in order to meet uh, their uh, needs uh, at care uh, at home, we can utilize the technology like, for example the accurate uh, vital sensing uh, by, you know, that very tiny uh, sensor. Of course, the machine running and the cost-effective uh, mechanical component or ele electrical components uh, with the uh, same detection accuracy uh, as the traditional components. Also, uh, it's important to make uh, the medical device easy to use you know, the small or lightweight for home care because the, many of patients are elderly. So, uh, the device have to uh, be more easy to use uh, to operate for elderly people. So in conjunction with such, you know, requirement, uh, I think uh, uh, some of the key uh, 
uh, technology for home care are uh, again uh, utilizing the uh, you know the, uh, digital technology uh, like the uh, sensing or AI machine learning etc. Okay, uh, thanks, Aki. Um, I'm going to skip to some of the questions from the the attendees in the in the group before I you know, go back to some of the questions I have myself, so that I can give a chance to to everyone to to. No, to the members of the audience to ask some questions. Um, the first question I I'm probably going to pose it to, to Elizabeth and Tejin would be, you know, what are your biggest challenges in incorporating a startup's technology into your business? I think that is a very challenging question. It's something which I'm sure even Lillian would be interested to find out as well, uh, because uh, she's probably uh, faced many such challenges. But maybe uh, Liz, I don't know, how, how does IHH incorporate or work with startups? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Yeah, it's it's a it's a good question, and uh, you know, I'd say there there's no one kind of uh, one size fits all answer. Uh, IHH is obviously a you know, a global company. We have many different business lines. Obviously, the core is on the hospital, but we also have primary care, for instance, in Singapore. We have a lab business in some of our markets. Uh, but I would say, generally speaking, the, the first and foremost important thing is identifying what is the problem statement or use case that the startup is really trying to solve and, and how important and relevant is that for a provider group like IHH. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, if there's a very clear problem that they're helping us address from a patient perspective, from a clinical perspective, from an operational perspective, then you know that that kind of checks that that first box right and then beyond that we know if we know that there's a clear problem that they're solving that the next question is really how can we integrate the technology within our existing workflows or our existing processes and this this almost relates to your earlier question Jianhui, about what, what do i see is the barrier or the one of the opportunities for technology uh so in, in our setting whether it's clinicians or nurses or even operators there are dozens of devices, systems that they're using from your electric, you know, electronic medical record system to your financial management system to not to mention all the devices, you know, Philips and whatnot devices are actually being used in a care setting. And what we don't want and what we don't need is another device or another system to add into the mix. Right. So, you know, figuring out how we can incorporate a new solution into existing processes and workflows where it doesn't require another step for a nurse or a doctor to, to take on. It doesn't require another uh, thing they need to check, but it can be seamlessly integrated and ideally in a centralized you know, viewpoint or some type of centralized area where they can see all of these data points in one place. That, that That's the second most important thing is, is how can we make sure that that solution can be integrated so that it can actually be adopted. Even if it solves a problem, but if, if it requires 10 extra steps, you know, no one's going to end up using it. So that's the, you know, the second area that I would say is, is important for us to address when we evaluate partnering with startups. Uh, and then the, the third question, which is important, which is, you know, what is the business model? You know, how, how does this uh, become a win-win situation for us and the startups that we work with, right? Uh, do we enable them to scale faster because of our presence in certain markets? Do we help them refine or iterate on their products because they have access to a certain patient pool? Uh, so how do we benefit them and vice versa? You know, how do we benefit ultimately our patients or you know, our doctors or oper our operators from partnerships? So I would say those are the three big questions we have in, in deciding you know, how and, and which startups we want to work with. Uh, and then beyond that, it's obviously, it's a, it's a process that we have to go through to actually implement the solution. Mm -hmm. But would a, would a startup need to have already obtained this FDA clearance, it's H in Singapore, the HSA clearance, yeah. before you can work with them? Yeah, so I would mm -hmm. say for medical devices uh, and anything that does require regulatory approval, we want them to have the appropriate regulatory approval in the relevant markets for us to be able to actively deploy their solution. Uh, and, and the main reason for that, it's actually very simple. You know, we're a private healthcare operator. We don't do a lot of clinical trials or research related work. In some aspects, we, we do focus on that, but generally speaking, that's not our main priority. 
And so for us to even be able to deploy the solution, we need to ensure that you know, they have the appropriate approvals in, as needed in each country. Okay, thanks Liz. And, and Aki, maybe I can ask you that, that same question as well. Um, you know, how do you incorporate a startup technology uh, into your business, uh, given that you are a, a medical uh, equipment uh, manufacturer as well? Yeah, so actually, yeah, uh, there are some challenges uh, to incorporate the uh, new technology into our system. So, uh, but the, uh, we have very, uh, 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 very many experiences uh, uh, to introduce the uh, foreign technologies into Japanese system. So, but the uh, typically, yeah. Uh, kind of the, uh, modifying the uh, original device into, you know, the Japanese setting is very important. For example, typically Japanese uh, elderly people, or, you know, can, cannot understand, cannot, uh, you know, uh, read the uh, English or other languages uh, on the devices. So uh, in such case, we have to, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the language, original languages into Japanese languages. So, but uh, Typically, uh, uh, having a collaboration with the startups from foreign countries, uh, we can take a kind of responsibility for Japanese markets. Uh, this is one of the uh, challenges. Also, as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, the important thing is to keep the existing workflow uh, for the uh, caregivers. So, uh, meaning, uh, uh, even in the new technologies, uh, introducing uh, it into the workflow as is, is very important. So uh, uh, for the startup, uh, you have to uh, really understand how uh, the existing devices are utilized uh, at the home setting. So uh, maybe I think uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, the startups can collaborate with uh, existing companies uh, taking the home care, hopefully <laughs> in Beijing. So, <laughs> I think this is a really a big challenge for, you know, the early stage startups. Okay, thanks Aki. And uh, I'm gonna sort of twist that question a little bit uh, for Lillian to also share her experience as she tries to, to, to sell to, to, uh, to corporates and other uh, big customers. What, what has your experience been? I think, you know, Liz kind of ticked a lot of the check boxes. It's mm. true that, you know, whatever that, uh, we as startups basically think it's like, you know, a world-changing or game-changing idea uh, cannot actually, um, you know, be materialized unless it fits into the system or fits into the workflow of what, you know, these um, clinicians are already doing. So absolutely right to say that, you know, we have always been challenged to say, are you integrated to, for example, EMR, right? Uh, are you adding more steps to what the nurses need to do, right? Is there more devices to charge and stuff like that? So I, I would say that, you know, we have been very blessed in a sense that through the, the learnings, you know, we have been able to uh, successfully, you know, uh, look at some of these integration and also to ensure that um, we minimize the amount of effort on the clinician's front, right, to adopt the system. So, for example, we, 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 when we first started with Cares for Wounds, we always say, oh, you can actually do an assessment in under one minute. Uh, but, you know, the, the nurses uh, will always come back and say, yeah, but for me to actually replicate this or to re-enter this in, into EMR, it takes me another five or 10 minutes. So I might as well basically use uh, whatever pen and paper, right, to do so, rather than actually, you know, uh, do two sessions, or rather to create records on two platforms. So right now we are actually working very, very hard to ensure that, you know, we can work with uh, the system provider, the EMR provider, to actually do that straight through integration. And because we ourselves, right, also create a, e we are also ourselves an EMR for home healthcare. So uh, the, the, the way we uh, sell to businesses uh, and also the um, uh, home healthcare organizations would be that if you leverage on our EMR, right, you are also going to be able to uh, use cash for wounds which will be able to directly bring in data into now your EMR. So that's how we try to string it on two different fronts. Right. I hope that answers your Thanks. question. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, that, that's been helpful. I'm sure that there are many more, uh, but we'll discuss this in, in a separate session. 
Um, uh, Aki, I think there's a question for you uh, with regards to whether you've seen any successful uh, business models for home-based healthcare in Japan. No. Um, I'm not sure whether you, you have come across such things, but I'll leave you to answer that particular question. Yeah, um, actually, there is no single answer for, for this question, but the, uh, speaking in the comments about the reimbursement, uh, the actually in Japan, uh, reimbursement for home care is a monthly basis. Uh, it, it's a general. So uh, making the successful business model is to think about, uh, you know, the kind of the de recurring model uh, of the, uh, of you know the uh, home based care. So uh, the actually in Tejin, uh, we are providing some of the non invasive ventilators to uh, patient home. So uh, again, the uh, the reimbursement is monthly basis. We are uh, uh, supporting patient uh, to set up, for example, devices to directly to patient home. Uh, we are also providing a monthly service to patient. And then as a consideration for the service, we are, uh, you know, the claiming uh, the investment uh, of the home care at a monthly basis. So it's not one-time payment uh, for the home care in Japan. So uh, the uh, startups, uh, uh, new companies uh, thinking of the business in Japan for home care have to think about the kind of recurring model uh, to the home care in Japan. All right. Thanks, Aki. Um, we are sort of running out of time, so I'm going to close the session with the last question from the audience, which is a slightly loaded one, I think. Um, but so I'm just I'm not going to ask you to articulate more on the on on what your reply is going to be. But if so, the question is this: Who would make the implementation of home-based healthcare technology successful? And uh, he listed three: Is it going to be the patient, the healthcare provider? or the payer. Um, and I'll ask, I'll go around uh, as the final question and just ask each of you to just tell me what uh, you believe is the uh, the one that's going to make this, uh, you know, critical, uh, uh, you know, basically make this a successful outcome. Uh, maybe Liz, you can start. Okay. Uh, okay. If I have to pick one of the three, I, I would say the payer. Okay. Uh, Lillian? Yeah, I think I think pretty much the payer because I mean I think money makes the world go round, right? So I think that that effectively will be the push, right, to allow people to actually have um, that service. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and Aki. Yeah. So again, in the case of Japan, I think the uh, it's the uh, home care provider. Uh, it's not the payer because the, uh, Japan again is using a national healthcare system. So private payer is not popular in Japan. Mm. So of course the uh, uh, the company have to think about the uh, the patient in order to set up the you know the devices easily. But the uh, providing the, uh, the kind of service, uh, very kind service to the patient is very important. So it's a role for the home care provider. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I think uh, it's been a very, fairly interesting session. I mean, I had a whole bunch of other questions I want to ask, but uh, we have hit the, our time limit already. I'm going to hand the time back to Jin, um, you know, to, to finish the session. Thank you, Xianhui. Um, thank you, everyone, for the great sharing and also to all our audience for your ongoing questions. So it is always very heartening to see so much enthusiasm at our online session. Um, but of course, real conversations often happen after. So we do hope that all of you can keep connected. Um, for startup founders looking for talent and individuals looking to start a career in deep tech startups, do take a look at some of the talent programs and platforms that SG Innovate has to offer by heading to our website, sginnovate.com. Um, the recording of this session will also be uploaded on SG Innovate's YouTube channel, so do head on there for a review of today's event. And till our next online event then, thank you everyone and goodbye. Hey, thanks everyone. Aki, Lillian, Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time and I hope to see you guys in person uh, real soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye-bye.